How did I get uh, into the martial arts and why? It was by accident. My mother, um, we moved into a new neighborhood up in the uh, Upper Pearl City area called Pacific Palisades. It was in June of 1971. We were coming back from the store. We'd gone grocery shopping with my mother. Uh, on the way back, we saw by the community center, the rec center, outside on the playground area, um, they had uh, kids doing martial arts. And, um, you know, we were making the turn to go home, and that's where we saw the kids um, training the martial arts. Half of the kids would be training in the pavilion area, in the, um, the covered area in, in the uh, rec center. And then they would send out the other half out on the playground area. I guess it was a good marketing technique. But anyways, my mother, she looks, she says, look, there's a, a karate going on over there. It looks like karate, but these guys are wearing uh, black uniforms. She says, I think I'm going to enroll you guys in it. You know, uh, the three older ones, it would be my sister Delji, my brother Gilbert, and myself. You know, the, the other three younger brothers, they were too young yet to uh, train martial arts. I, I really didn't think anything of it. I didn't care because um, by that point in my life, you know, uh, I really didn't hang around with anybody but my family. You know, I'd hang around with my older brothers or play with my uh, younger brothers and uh, because I didn't know anyone in the neighborhood. I was new to the neighborhood. But anyways, um, she enrolled us and we trained. It, it, I believe it was on a Saturday. We came in Saturday morning. There was a bunch of... Uh, there was a, a giant group that enrolled at the same time. And, um, you know, I went there and I, I really didn't, I really didn't find any interest in it. And I really wasn't any good at it. I, at the beginning, I, I really sucked. I, I had no interest in it at all, you know, I'll tell you the truth. And um, my older brother and my younger, my older brother and my older sister, they showed no interest in it either. And they, uh, their classes were on, uh, you know, the weeknights, and they wouldn't go. They would end up not going. And so I, you know, I ended up not going to the classes either, you know, because I saw that they wouldn't go. My mother didn't know anything about this because she was working at that time. She was a single parent, so she was out of the house most of the time. And that's why I think she enrolled us in the martial arts to have us uh, occupy our time instead of just, you know, go hang out and up to no good or you know just be around the house all the time but anyways um you know one day the instructor called up uh, the guy's name was martin bill he called up and he says um you know your kids haven't been um training you know in the classes you know and, but you're still paying for these classes do they still want to train you know i just don't want to uh keep getting your money but these guys don't show up so my mother she you know called us over and she said you know i heard you guys ain't going I'm not going to class and i'm not going to waste my money so she asked us if we still wanted to uh train the martial arts and my older sister said no she didn't want to and my older brother said no he didn't want to so you know something made me say yes you know i i, don't, I really don't know what it was you know i you know i'll get back to that later but i I don't know what it was, but something inside of me just told me, yes, you know, I still wanted to train. And I went back and I still wasn't interested. I wasn't that good. You know, the, the, the people there, the, the older instructors, some, somehow they just, I don't know if they saw something in me or they just wanted to motivate me a little bit better. But they helped me a lot. And then the people that I went to school with, I noticed that they were training the martial arts too. And they, they would help me, you know, in... Uh, in a lot of the the things the katas the sparring and the self-defense and you know i just i saw that and you know it made me feel a lot better that you know they were telling me hey you're pretty good you know just keep practicing keep trying i kept up with it and i i liked it you know i, I liked it better than what i did when i first started and um you know i was glad that they, they people were um interested in in my improvement in in the martial arts or in anything you know the more they they uh complimented me the more i kept training the more i got more interested and um the more friends i made in the martial arts in school and in the martial arts because I, all the people that i hung around in school they were all you know they all trained at godin's and they, were, they all became my friends my lifelong friends a lot of them i didn't see a long time 
you know, some I, you know, just broke away and don't talk to them anymore. But that's that's how I uh, got into the martial arts. It was just by accident, you know. It's, that's that's how it all came to be. How did I come up with the title, The Black Robe? It, it's a very lengthy um, answer, and um, it, it it goes back from uh, James Mitosi when he started the uh, the Kosheru Kempo back in the the early 30s to the 40s. At, at one point, Professor Metosi, I mean, he wore white gi up to a certain point in his uh, his martial arts journey. He, he wore uh, black, I guess, it, to set him apart, <clears throat> to just, uh, distinct the, the instructor from the students. The students, you know, wore white and the, the, the instructor in charge wore black, which was James Metosi. And then Professor Chow, he, he um he kept that tradition also. He liked the black, and I think later on Professor Chow, at one point he had all his students were black. How uh, Professor Godin, you know, he had all his students, and the, as well as the instructors, everybody wore black. I guess he liked the being a, a an outcast because he was he was looked upon as an outcast, and he said that we fit the description as an outcast or a black sheep in the martial arts, the Kempo people. You know, um, in the tournaments, they were really looked upon as rebels. And uh, uh, the, the way I, I, the reason why I say that is because a lot of the uh, the traditional martial arts, they all wore white geese. And th there was a um, an organization called the Hawaii Karate Congress. They were the ones who who uh, ran all the uh, martial arts uh, competitions here, the tournaments, you know, it all went through the Karate Congress and it was really heavy, heavily, there, there was a lot of uh, traditional karate guys in the Hawaii Karate Congress, okay, they, they really saturated it with a lot of uh, uh, Japanese traditional style. And the Kempo guy, you know, we were very few, but, um, you know, they looked upon us as rebels because they, we didn't have that traditional stiff style, you know, we were more, they were more eclectic and they, they, they cross-trained in a lot of things, you know, you can get, which was brought on by, you know, the Kempo Jiu-Jitsu and then later on to the, the Kaji Kempo. But Professor Godin said that we fit that style because, you know, our style was a real hard two-fisted uh, uh, attack or two, uh, you know, uh, multiple uh, kicking technique instead of one just one strong blow, one strong block with one strong punch. You know, if we miss, we followed up with another punch or kick. So it was constantly, uh, there was constant movement, you know, in it. And people mis mistook that for unsportsmanlike conduct because a lot of the Kempo guys would rush the guys out of the ring, you know, because they would miscouple with, with, with certain techniques or combinations and they would keep going, you know. And a lot of times they, they hit their opponent in the face because a lot there, there were a lot of uh, self-defense practitioners and the way that they... They trained their techniques was to hit the uh, the groin and the, uh, the the face, you know. Be you know whether you know it was intent or by accident. You know it depends on the the, the fighter, the Kempo stylist. But anyways, uh, he said that we fit the we fit the description as as the black sheep and the outcast because the the karate hunger saw us as that, and um, he was the one that told me that what he liked the best about the. The, the the men in black, the boys in black, or the the black robe, the guys, the the martial artists who wore the black robe. I came up with that black robe. A guy named Kenneth Funakoshi, who once was a Kempo uh, Kaji Gamble student, he he trained under uh, with uh, Adriano Emperado at one time. For how long, I'm not exactly sure. But uh, Kenneth Funakoshi, who went on to uh, do the the Shotokan, he was good friends with. Um, Professor Godin, and he told Professor Godin, you know, you know, you guys are always fighting with, you know, uh, this hard style and everything, and you guys are getting DQ'd all the time. So you guys, when you guys show up to uh, the tournaments, you all wearing your black geese like you're showing up to uh, to a funeral. And Godin says, yeah, yeah, we are going to a funeral. We're going to the white geese funeral. So, uh, you know, he made Kenneth laugh at that, you know, because they were, they were good friends, you know. There was no hostility or no animosity or... You know, it was a friendly rivalry competition, you know, between uh, uh, Mr. Ponokoshi and uh, Professor Godin. But that is how I came up with the, uh, the black robe. Okay, the next question is, is how uh, has Hawaii made an impact 
on Kaji Campbell or the martial arts in general. Well, that that's uh, that that's like one. Uh, that is a good question. You know, it, it it made an impact in the martial arts by um, through Kaji Campbell because you know Kaji, the the martial arts, with the exception of the Campbell uh, Jiu Jitsu style from uh, from uh, Professor Matosi, you know, a lot of the martial arts were always in its purest form. You had you had the judo uh, stylist that that practiced um, in purely uh, in judo, or the Jiu Jitsu stylist. They all you know, they, they trained uh, exclusively in that, you know, and so forth. Okay, well, with Kempo, they did a lot of joint locking and they did um, a lot of the, the hand and uh, kicking technique, you know, but it was it was still uh, limited. But when uh, the Kaji Kempo guys got together, the, uh, Uncle Frank, when he got together with all his friends um, that he knew, you know, Adriano Imperato, George Chang, Peter Chu, uh, and Joe Hoke, and then his... Uh, his uh, god brother uh, Adriano Imperato, along with Joe Imperato, he doesn't get a lot of credit, but they they combined their styles all together. You know, they were still limited in this one style, or or uh, the styles that they trained in. They were either you know uh, limited to that one style, or or knew just like the basics of it. But anyways, they they got together and they created this mixed martial arts. It is the first art that was combined together in the United States. So the the, the style of Kaji Kembo was born in uh, the Hawaiian territories, which later became the United States. So it is it is very American. The, you know, it's uh, Kaji Kembo is very American. That was you know influenced by a lot of traditional martial arts that came uh, from the Orient along with uh, American boxing. So that um, it, how it influenced it, um, how did it influence the martial arts as a whole in the United States? It, it, it influenced them a lot, you know, by uh, people from Hawaii, you know, you had uh, uh, Aleo Reyes and uh, Tony Ramos and, and there was a bunch of other guys that went out that, that left Hawaii, you know, whether they had a, a better uh, job offer in the mainland or they were uh, in the military, but when they left to the mainland, they introduced the art of Kaji Kembo to the mainland. I mean, uh, Ed Parker was credited for the American Kembo through, uh, you know, he was teaching them the um, uh, Professor Chow style and then Ed Parker, he, he uh, refined it to his techniques. All these other Kaji Kembo guys, they went out and they, they introduced the, uh, the system of Kaji Kembo to the rest of uh, the U.S. mainland and then that's how it influenced a lot of people. It touched a lot of people, and they from there they went off. It it traveled to the East Coast and it traveled overseas. For that story, you know, um, you'd have to uh, you know check with the others who uh, who who trained under these uh, people like Tony Ramos, and Leo Reyes, and uh, uh, Ed Parker. But that that is how um, it in the the arts, Kaji Campbell and Campbell, you know, influenced them. Um, martial arts in the, the U.S. mainland. When did I realize I wanted to uh, publish a book? It was never my intent to uh, publish a book. Professor Godin, when, uh, when he reached a certain point in his life, he, uh, he wanted to write a book on his life in Kaji Gamble and in, uh, when he was incarcerated. And mostly he wanted to talk about his experience with Joe Imperato and the, what happened that night, but also his training uh, with Joe in the martial arts, you know, at the Palama settlement and uh, their friendship and how they trained together out in uh, secluded areas out in parks. But um, Godin, he wasn't a writer, so he was going to have this guy, <clears throat> former student of his, uh, um, Bruce Corrigan, who, who trains under the Karazempo Goshin Jitsu, which is a system that uh, Professor Godin and uh, Professor Sonny Gascon, they created back in uh, the 19, 1960, 61, I believe it was. Anyways, Bruce Corrigan is a very exceptional martial artist. He has a school out in uh, um, Tennessee. It's called uh, Fusion Martial Arts. They they are uh, an eclectic system also. He uh, he trains he trains in many and and teaches in many different systems. Bruce was also a uh, intelligence officer in the United States Navy. So that's why I think Professor Godin picked him to do uh, be the writer of the book was because uh, he was very meticulous in the way he 
wrote out his reports, you know, and, and the way he spoke, you know, he was very articulate. And, you know, Godin saw him as, as the guy, he was the one that he wanted to write the book. I just wanted the book to get introduced to the Kaji Gamble world. So what I did is I got in contact with uh, Black Belt Magazine and I asked them if they could do an interview with Godin, you know, so that way they could introduce the book to the world when the book was completed. Black Belt Magazine, they turned down my offer because they said that, you know, Godin wasn't well known, you know. And I explained to them that in the Kaji Gamble system, everybody knows who Godin is, Professor Godin is. But they still, they turned down my offer. So what I did was I, you know, I said, how am I going to get this out? So I went out and I, uh, I got some money out of my, um, my retirement account. And I, I made this uh, magazine. It was called Fighting Arts Y Magazine. I did five issues of it. But the first inaugural issue was the interview with Professor Godin. And he basically, he talked about his beginning, Kajikevo beginnings. And what happened, gave a little brief description, you know, a little tease there on how what had happened that night, you know. He didn't really explain in detail, you know. He just went into little hints on what had happened that, that evening. And, um, but mostly he just talked about his life and how he got, uh, you know, he went um, from being a warrior to a prisoner, you know, when he got incarcerated. And, uh, you know, that the magazine did all right, you know. Um, you know, that issue, it went all right, but other than that, the, the other issues that went down, and, but that's another story. But anyways, you know, um, I gave some information to Bruce Corrigan, but Bruce is a very, as I said before, a very good martial artist. He's an exceptional martial artist, and he's in demand. A lot of people want him to do seminars, and Bruce was also learning from other people, different styles, so he was very busy in his schedule, and I guess he was unable to... to um, you know, take the time out and do it. So I reached a point in my life when I was getting to retire and, it, you know, there were some things that were going on in my life and I saw myself as a guy, you know, I ain't going to live forever. And I think somebody, people need to know the story on what really happened uh, that night, you know, with uh, that incident, that life-changing and life, you know, life-changing incident for Professor Godin and uh, a life-ending incident for uh, his instructor, Joe. So people think that I did it just on the spur of the moment, but no, I, I knew the story for many years, about like uh, 17 or 18 years, and I really battled with it. I was thinking to myself, God, you know, <clears throat> you know, should I go out and, and, and tell, and you know, because uh, I wasn't sure how it was going to, how it was going to react to like the family members or anything like that. But uh, as I thought about it, I went on, I said, you know what, I, I'm going to do this for my instructor, my professor, you know, I say he's my professor. Not just my professor, but he was my instructor. You know, Godin, as I got to know him, you know, in later years as an adult, I seen him as a kid, as a child. But as I got older and I, I realized that he was my true instructor, okay? We, we were studying under his, under his uh, method, but I'm not going to get into that. But, but what it is is that I wanted them to know what really happened, that he was not a coward. He did not run away to lead Joe to die and bleed to death, you know, and, uh, you know, we had that, that, um, that tag in the Kaji Kemba world as a coward, you know, because he, who, everybody who knew him knew he was not a coward, and, um, you know, the, for one fact is, is that, you know, Adriano and Parado, the older brother of, uh, of Joe and Parado, you know, for, for a couple of years of his life, he wanted Godin to, when he traveled, Godin was his, um, his bodyguard. Why would uh, Adriano want a coward to be his bodyguard? I, Adriano, he must have knew somehow that, you know, that Professor Godin did not run and leave his brother to die, you know. Godin, he really didn't care that he had that, that, that Im you know, that, that tag of that image of being a coward. He really didn't care. He didn't really care what other people said about him. You know, he could defend himself. But he just wanted it for his family, you know, that, that his grandchildren or his daughters or... Uh, you know, great great grandchildren, whatever, or anybody in his family with the Godin name, he didn't want them to have that that tag on them, you know, that uh, reputation. So he wanted it to be cleared 
And I, I felt, you know, I, I want to do this. I, I'm going to be the guy to tell the story. If nobody's going to tell it, I'm going to, I'm going to go and, and tell the story of what happened that night. That was the reason why I wanted to publish the book. And, and the, the thing of it is, is that um, that's what's so ironic is that, you know, I put in the book, you know, that, that the, the, the facts that I gave from the transcripts of what, what ha had happened that night, there, there will still be people in the Kajik system that, that will interpret the truth in their own way. You know, they, they still, there's people that see it. I know that they read the story. And uh, in fact, um, a friend of mine, a martial artist, her name is Kalani Koa. She told me that um, Jody Emperado, the son, the, I mean, excuse me, the, the daughter of Joe Emperado, you know, um, read the book, the, uh, the story of what happened for, for uh, case H29234, which is Joe's, uh, the, the report of his, uh, the, the stabbing incident. She still believes that um, Joe, the bar called up Joe and told Joe that there was going to be a fight and they need, he needed to come down to work, you know, to break up that fight to make sure that, that there wasn't going to uh, be any trouble. They said the fight was going to be over a girl, but that's not what had happened. So people still, the facts that I presented, they still going to, you know, see the truth in their own way. And, and, that, and that's, that's fine too. But I do, the thing is that I, I did what I, I did, you know, by presenting all these facts and, you know, there's, there's some people, though, some old timers in, in, in the, the KSDI, they don't care what had happened, you know, because they never cared about my instructor in the first place, but, you know, they, they still, um, they still believe on what was, uh, what they were conditioned to believe by the higher ups. You know, on what what had happened. The history is what we say history is, and that is the reason why I published the book. Okay, the next question is: What advice would I give to younger martial artists or older martial artists? The the younger uh, martial artists, you know, is uh, who who's starting out at the beginning. You know, I I think you should just go out, you know, and check out martial arts schools that. Um, that's gonna fit your goals or, or what it is that you, you you're looking for in the martial arts, be it self defense or, or physical fitness or a competition. You know, it's go out and look at all these different uh, martial arts schools and the instructors. Keep an eye on them. You know, see how they communicate and how how what their uh, level of uh, of uh, training is like, and most of all, their their communication skills and on the level of the, the, their teaching, uh, the techniques that they're teaching. You know, it's, it, it's good to be uh, loyal to your instructor, to a school or to a, a, a system. You know, but uh, Shakespeare had once said that, uh, you know, to thine own self be true. So it's, make sure that it, that is good for you. You know, the, the individual is more important to the art. You know, the great Bruce Lee once said, and I, I agree with that. Make sure it's going to fit you and you can adapt to your style, you know, be it, you know, spiritual level, competition, physical fitness, self-defense, but whatever it is that you, that you're looking to uh, achieve. Getting back to the instructor, you make, make sure that, that uh, they are not a person uh, who, who can manipulate you or, uh, you know, be a control freak, you know, I, I really, you know, stress that a lot, you know, that there, there's a lot of that instructors who, who uh, take advantage of the, the, their rank or their status, you know, that they can manipulate these people who are very vulnerable and uh, really look up to them and, you know, they get into the things that they don't want to do or they try and control their lives, you know, outside of the, uh, the uh, training hall. You know, keep an eye out for that. And, you know, we as martial arts instructors, you know, especially with high-ranking ones, uh, you know, we have a responsibility to uh, not take advantage of these kind of things. That That's my advice to uh, both young and old, you know, and uh, if you're an older martial artist, you know, you, you have to set your goals at, as, uh, you have to be real about it, you know, you can't be 70 or 80 years old and think like, all right, I want to fight in the mixed martial arts. Uh, fight you know or a promotion or something like that that's not going to happen you know it's it's you just um you know you you, you train uh 
you know, at your level, you know, your instructor and a good instructor will, will uh, recognize that and he won't, you know, be in comparison with you with the, the other younger students, you know, if he does, you know, that's, that's, that's not a good thing, but, you know, train at your, your pace and, um, what you can do, you know, uh, a lot of people, you know, who are, who are older, you know, that uh, a lot of them, they like to be on the spiritual level or, you know, go into the softer styles, you know, which is good, you know, it's, it's a health thing. Even uh, the harder styles, you know, as a physical fitness, is, that's, that's good also, but, you know, um, be advised, you know, be aware that you know, as we reach a certain age, our, our our recovery or you know healing process is a little slower than the than the younger people. So we we have to um, listen to our bodies. You know, if uh, if you're in pain, you know your body is telling you something. It's gonna you're gonna take a a little bit longer to recover. Is what I'm trying to say than than the younger people. So listen, pay attention to your body. Don't try and rush yourself. You know, just uh, take your time. Um, you get there. Don't uh, don't try and uh, push yourself through the pain. You know, uh, just take your time. You'll get there, and uh, you'll achieve your goals. Just um, you know, get a good instructor that will uh, try and um, help you achieve those goals, and they, they won't uh, push you beyond your limits that you're supposed that you know you shouldn't go beyond. That's my uh, my advice to you, uh, to the older people and to the younger people. As far as seminars go, you know, will I, will I be going to, any, not seminars, but any uh, events or anything that I'll, I'll be attending? I don't see any in the future. I haven't looked around. I haven't been invited to any. Um, I haven't had any people that were uh, the, uh, inquiring about it. So right now, I, I, I don't see um, any anything in the near future. And if anyone ever wants to uh, get in touch with me, they can uh, they can email me at fightingarts at msn.com, or they can go to the, my website at uh, blackrobe.net, or they can uh, go ahead and get in touch with my uh, my publisher, uh, the greatest publisher in the world, the Big Kahuna, Zach uh, Royer, um, at uh, Kahuna Publications. He's very good. You can you know get in touch with him, or if if you're uh, a martial artist who's interested in, you know, writing or publishing a book, you know, I, I suggest that you go and uh, check out Zach. Zach is really good. He's, he's, he'll work with you and he'll help you, he'll help you a lot. I mean, he's, uh, he's, he, he wrote, uh, a lot of books himself and, um, he has, uh, he publishes other, uh, other writers' books and he'll work with you, he'll help you and, um, that's about it. I, I, uh, I thank you for this time. Keep uh, training. Keep learning. Keep teaching. Never stop. You know, keep keep the sword sharp. Never stop training. I mean, it's 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 so easy to just say, you know what, I I can't train today. You know, I I I, I can't do martial arts today. I got to do something else. It's easy to say that, you know, but it's who we are. We're, we're martial artists. We have to make the time. We have to push ourselves. We have to be an example to. To, to other people, you know, you, to a real, a bear, uh, an exceptional martial artist, he recognizes skill and he recognizes talent and he can tell who, who's training and who slacks and who doesn't train or who's just a good talker, you know, um, they recognize that, you know, and um, that's, that's about it, what I got to say, and I, I thank you for your time and attention and, uh, you know, God bless you and take care. You know, every day is a battle. God in the martial arts is taking me through each day. And, and I uh, and really appreciate it and really give all the glory to God. You know, thank you for your time. Aloha, take care.